Many popular atheists have claimed that faith is believing in something in spite of the evidence or believing something with no evidence at all. And this claim has stuck to the idea of religion so that most people assume that religions, like Christianity, are simply ways to live a moral life and they have nothing further to do with reality. However, this definition of faith is a misconception, and Christians have held mature, detailed views of what faith is for centuries. In this video, I am going to define faith and discuss its relationship with reason. I'll first survey historical Christian views of faith and reason, and then I'll explain one particular view in depth and show its implications for apologetics. So I hope you'll stick around and discover historic Christian positions on the relationship between faith and reason. Welcome back, everyone. In this lecture, we are going to be talking about faith and reason. Uh, this is one of the last lectures we're doing in this series. And like I said in the intro, in this lecture, we're going to be looking at the relationship between faith and reason. A lot of people in our culture think that faith, by definition, is believing something that's not true. So I, I, th I think this uh, lecture is going to be really helpful for believers and non-believers just to clear up the air on what uh, cr the, these historic Christian understandings of faith and reason are. Um, I, I think this is great, and it also kind of points out that, you know, uh, when you think about it, a lot of us really do have faith regardless of whether we're religious or not. So I think you're going to enjoy this lecture, and uh, and let's go ahead and just get started in it. So uh, in my last lecture, I presented this, at, you know, at the beginning of all these, I present a Bible passage just to get us thinking about things and to see what the Bible has to say about certain topics. In my last lecture, I, I already presented this passage, and I promised that I would get more in-depth into it in the next lecture. So uh, usually, whenever I present one, I'd talk about it twice, and i go in more detail in the first one. But in this episode, I was going to go more in detail into it because this passage is, is more pertinent to uh, what we're talking about today. So our Bible passage for today is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 2. And it states, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by this our ancestors were approved. So I, I promised in the last lecture I would talk more about this here. And of course, you know, today we're talking about faith and reason. So this is why I chose this passage. Um, you know, if you, if you look into the book of Hebrews, start studying that uh I'm not necessarily certain exactly who the uh, author is. I think some people think it was uh, Paul. Some people think it was Luke. Um, but anyways, um, the authors of Luke, uh, or excuse me, the author of Hebrews says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Uh, so I have a quote from a uh, one of my, um, it's, more, it's actually a more of a popular level uh, uh, commentary on the Bible by uh, Warren Weirs, by I, I Hope I said his last name right. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone say his name out loud. But anyways, uh, he says, Three words in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 summarize what, the, what, the, what true Bible faith is. Reality, proof, and approved. The word translated reality, also translated as substance, means literally to stand under, to support. Faith is to a Christian what a foundation is to a house. He goes on to say, the word proof simply means conviction. This is the inward conviction from God that what he has promised he will perform. And then uh, Weirs goes on to say, approved, also translated as obtained a good report, is an important word in Hebrews 11. It occurs not only in verse 2, but also once in verse 4 and once in verse 39. The summary in Hebrews 12, 1, calls this list of men and women so great a cloud of witnesses. So, according, and that's from his commentary on Hebrews, obviously. But so, according to Warren Wears here in in this commentary, I was looking at what he's saying is is that uh, when you look at these, when you break down these words in the Hebrew, excuse me, in the Greek, um, you see that reality. Uh, Reality is also translated, it could also be translated as substance. Uh, proof could also be translated as conviction. So, you know, you could just read this in a different way and say, now faith 
is the substance of what is hoped for, the conviction of what is not seen. For by this our ancestors received a good report. Uh, and I just really think this, this uh, understanding of the passage goes really well with the view of faith and reason I was going to talk about today. I told you I was going to uh, look at uh, several views from the history of Christianity, but I'm going to go into one uh, view in, in depth. But yeah, you know, t- um, what, what, what we're saying is uh, you could take this passage to say, now faith is the substance of what is hoped for, the conviction of what is not seen. And that basically says that faith, you, you know, you don't, you don't just have faith and it's not attached to something, right? You have faith in someone or in something. And, and kind of what we think this, this uh, uh, points to is that we have faith in the promises of God, right? Um, we, we, are, we have conviction that what God has told us is true. We, not, we might not be able to see uh, God at the moment. We might not be able to prove uh, that what he says is true, but in looking in history and look at the way he has acted uh, in history and always came through on his promises to humanity, uh, we trust in the promises of God, uh, including the promise of Jesus, that he will resurrect us at the end of days. We trust in God, uh, and by this we are approved. And we're just like those uh, that list of witnesses who were all these champions of the faith, right? They all had, they all had faith in, in the promises of God. So anyways, uh, you can just be keeping this passage in mind as we go through this. Um, but uh, before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and read these questions for reflection that I read at the beginning of all these lectures. You know, uh, you can be thinking about these as we go through the material. Uh, if you want to interact with me, you can uh, maybe uh, provide an answer to one of these questions in the comment section if you're watching this on, on video, on YouTube, or some other site like that. Um, or if you are listening to this in a podcast, you can always send me an email. If you go to my academic website, bcalkelts.com, there's a contact, um, there's a contact button you can click on and you can send me an email directly. So anyways, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, or you can just be thinking about this uh, for your own reflection. So here's our questions for this lecture. The first one is, have you ever heard someone say that faith is believing in something, although you know it is false? or although there is evidence against it? Two, have you ever heard someone say that atheism uses only reason and religion uses only faith? And three, how would you answer someone who claims that religions only utilize faith? So I'm hoping you're going to get the answer to that last one by the end of this. Um, I I mean, I know you're going to get an answer to it. I'm just hoping that you find an answer that you like. Or maybe if you're uh, a non-believer, maybe you'll you'll uh, learn some things from this so you can understand how Christians actually view this. So here's just a list of things. If you see my slides, here's just a list of things we want to touch on today. So first, I wanted to start with showing you the popular misconception, the popular atheist view of faith and reason. Nothing against atheists, but I'm just showing some popular atheists who have written in books and talk on this subject. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show what they say faith is. And the thing is, usually they say all this in the context of Christianity and arguing why Christianity is false. Uh, so what I'm arguing is that they have like a straw man view of what faith is. That's not what that's not what believers think faith is. So anyways, and, and to show you this, I'm going to give you a historical tour of some Christian views on faith and reason. Then, like I said, I was going to go in, in detail and... Um, Maybe, I think I've mentioned this before, I'm a big fan of Thomas Aquinas, and he has a view on faith and reason that I I like and I hold to. So I'm going to go into in detail on his view of faith and reason, and then I'm going to talk about practical applications that this has for apologetics and just um, everyday life. So... Anyways, let's let's uh, begin with talking about the popular atheist view of faith and reason. So, not every single atheist is going to believe like this, but I have a selection of. And when I say popular atheists, I mean atheists who write popular level books and usually aren't um, too deeply trained in philosophy. Right? Um, I make I you know you kind of hear all these terms of. People label different atheists different things. Um, 
I would, if I was talking about an atheist who is like a professional philosopher, I would mention that if I say a popular atheist, I mean someone who's basically an atheist and, and talks about it, writes books about it, um, for a popular level audience. And usually they're not that philosophically trained. Uh, so anyways, I haven't said all this. There's a popular atheist uh, named Dan Barker, who is, I believe, the co-founder, also president of the Freedom from from Religion Foundation. He says he used to be a Christian. Uh, he was a, he, but he was a minister and a, a music, uh, a music minister and an even um, evangelist for many years before he became an atheist and started writing books and trying to spread the good news that uh, there is no God. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, here's here's a uh, quote from him from his book Godless. So he writes, like the lonely heart who keeps waiting for the phone to ring, I kept trusting that God would someday come through. He never did. The only proposed answer was faith, and I gradually grew to dislike the smell of that word. I finally realized that faith is a compound, a defeat, an admission that the truths of religion are unknowable through evidence and reason. Okay? Uh, he also he goes on to say, religious faith is not adjustable. It remains strong in spite of a lack of evidence or in spite of contrary evidence. So there you see uh, Dan Barker defining faith as basically something that you either have no proof for or it's in spite of evidence. So it's something that you know to be false because the evidence proves otherwise. Another popular atheist is uh, someone named George Smith. He wrote a book um, called Atheism, The Case Against God. Really short quote, but in that book he says, Faith is believed without or in spite of reason. So there you, there you go. There's just another example. And then finally, uh, Richard Dawkins, a uh, famous, uh, what is he? I think he's an evolutionary biologist. Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The God Delusion. And his quote in this book says, it is in the nature of faith that one is capable, like Young, of holding a belief without adequate reason to do so. So there you go. Uh, he's, he's maybe not saying that faith is against the evidence, but he's at least saying that if you have faith in something, it's because you have no other reason to hold it. You just believe it's true for no reason. Okay? What I have found so interesting with all this is that usually in these books, uh, these people might not be... Uh, Dan Barker does, but um, all these uh, popular atheists aren't necessarily arguing against Christianity, but they are arguing against um, the idea that God exists. But I, I think this is so interesting because they're trying to say, this is what faith is, guys. They're saying, here's all the reasons to not be religious. Here's all the reasons to not be a Christian, because this is what faith is. But I found this interesting because they actually don't know how Christians themselves view faith. Um, this is what I'm going to show you in this lecture is that this is not the Christian view of what faith is. Okay, so uh, they say all these things. And I, I've always wondered, like, what you're going to find is that you could easily find these positions on faith and reason uh, through a simple Google search. It wouldn't take you but five, uh, not even five minutes to find that Christians throughout the centuries have believed uh, how they define faith and that they don't define faith as what the popular atheists do. So uh, the so I, I think that these popular atheists are, uh, first of all, I find this surprising because, for one, it's just false. So uh, it's misleading. It's also easily refuted, right? Uh I'm going to show you there's a book on it. Like there's a book where where Christians are arguing back and forth how how should we define faith and reason? What is their relationship? There's like there's books on this out there right now and if you just typed in faith and reason you would find it. Whether you, you did a Google search for faith and reason Christianity or faith and reason Christianity in Amazon, you're going to find all these books on it. So it's always it's always blown me away that these popular atheists are saying all this. Because it's a, it's not the correct uh, view of faith and reason that Christians hold, and uh, their audience, though, the the people that are listening to these popular level atheists, are just soaking this in and being like, oh yeah, that's you know that's the way, uh, uh, that's what faith is. So yeah, I don't want to hold to that. 
but it's a straw man position. It's not what Christians believe. So, anyways, um, to dispel this false idea of what faith is, at least to the Christian, anyways, you know, maybe for Dan Barker, his faith was just holding things that he thought was false. Um, but that's not what Christianity teaches, and I'm surprised he didn't uh, learn this in school. But because he did, he did uh, earn. Um, he did earn a degree in religion, so I was just surprised that he didn't hear that in class. But anyways, um, like I've been saying, it's it's really easy to find these historic views on uh, what faith and reason are. Uh, if you're looking at my slides, I have a picture of a book called Faith and Reason, Three Views. Uh, it's edited by Steve Wilkins, and uh, it's a great book. It's one of those debate books. Do you know what I'm saying? It's uh, there's three main views that are that are argued for in the book, and the way the format of these is, I love these types of books. Um, the the fir- the there's three main views, like it says, on faith and reason. So, uh, in this book, it talks about the tension between faith and reason view, faith seeking understanding view, and the synthesis of faith and reason view. So you've got these three views, and what happens is in the first well in the first chapter, it's usually the editor introducing the debate. But then in the next chapter, the first one of the authors goes first, and uh, he or she will will make the case, like have a whole chapter on give all the explain what their position is, and then give all the reasons why they believe it's true. And then in the next, after that author goes, the other two authors will, um, from their point of view, will will comment on that author's uh, position. So they'll they'll t- say what they agree with it, what they disagree, and all that stuff. And then the next author goes, and then the other two critique that author, and then the third author goes, and the other two critique that author. And it's just really under, it's really interesting uh, watching them go back and forth, but also hearing what their positions are from their own words. So if you are interested in diving deeper into this, I highly recommend this book, Faith and Reason, Three Views. Uh, It's by InterVarsity Press. It's edited by Steve Wilkins. So, but I, really quickly, I wanted to go. Uh, I just wanted to kind of do a quick review of these three views before I go in depth into the synthesis of faith and reason view. Okay, so one of the views in the book is called the tension view, and you see on my slides it's defined as faith is a relation, not a proposition. Reason is a supplement to faith and never a substitute. And uh, on my slides, I have three uh, major uh, Christian figures who held this. I'm going to have three major uh, Christian figures that held to all these, uh, just to give you an idea of, of how I, I want to. I wanted to show these to give you an idea of how old these views are, and also give you an idea of uh, the major figures that held them. So maybe you. Maybe you'll like one of them, and, and it kind of gives you a starting point to see which one you think is, is the best one. But anyways, uh, this tension view is held by Tertullian, Martin Luther, Blaise Pascal. Those are just a few examples of uh, Christians who have held this view. Uh, Tertullian, if you are familiar with that church father, he, I think he lived from around 155 A.D. to around 240 A.D. So that we're talking uh, the century after uh Jesus was on the earth about a hundred years later after Jesus' ascension. Uh, this view is already being argued for by a church father. So it just amazes me that these uh, um, these popular atheists are trying to define faith in this way. But Christians have already held these mature views on faith and reason um, for centuries, for over a thousand years. So, but anyways, let's talk about the tension view. So. Um, yeah, the, the first view, like I said, is the tension view. This view puts a lot of emphasis on faith in the Bible, okay? Generally, it says that reason is subservient to faith because reason is tainted by sin, especially in uh, non-believers. Uh, a major aspect of this view is that it emphasizes that faith is a relation, not a proposition, you, like you saw in the definition there. Faith isn't something that needs to be filled in with truths that are discovered through reason. Faith is a trust in God and his word. Okay? Now, but even though this view puts a high emphasis on faith, I do want to emphasize that it still makes room for reason. It's not just a complete fideism that says to shut your mind off and don't use your reason whatsoever. 
Um, it is. It says it is possible for for reason to supplement faith, although it can although reason can never act as a substitute for faith. Um, so that that's the view, and and, and it's just saying that uh, faith is great. It's supple. Uh, excuse me. Reason is great. It supplements faith, uh, but it's never a substitute for faith. And this view puts a you know a high emphasis, a high view of the Bible. Not like these other views don't. But, um, you know, I, out of all the views, uh, out of all the views, uh, this one is probably the, um, the one that puts the least emphasis on reason. But it's called the tension view because it's saying that you can, uh, you know, maybe this is uh, the, the one that's, this view is nothing like what the popular atheists say, but it's, it's closer to that. It's saying that there's kind of a tension between faith and reason. Um, but we always just... Uh, if if there's tension between faith and reason, and we see one thing with reason, and, and faith tells us another, that what the Bible tells us says another, then we're always going to just um, default to what the Bible says, and we can use reason to supplement faith, but it'll, it's never a substitute. Okay, faith-seeking understanding view is the next view, and uh, my slides have this defined as. Uh, this view says, reason is a powerful tool if guided by a regenerated mind and will. Reason guided by faith can be used to explain truths of faith and to guide biblical interpretation and understanding. Okay, reason is a powerful tool if guided by a regenerated mind and will. Reason is guided by faith, basically is what it says. And uh, if you've ever heard of the faith-seeking understanding view of the church father Augustine of Hippo is really famous for talking about this view. But other major Christians who have held this view are Anselm of Can Canterbury, St. Anselm, and uh, John Calvin. So, And you see Augustine of Hippo lived in 354 A.D., around 430 A.D., so that's an older view as well. And, uh, the you know, this, I kind of have them listed in, in the degree in which they place emphasis on reason. And so this second view is it's similar to the tension view, but the main difference between this view and the tension view is really the degree uh, in which they, it believes that reason can aid faith. Uh, similar to the tension view, the faith-seeking understanding view says that sin provides an obstacle for non-believers and places a limit on what they can know about God and spiritual things, right? Uh both views hold that the unregenerate mind uh, and will cannot know and love God. So, uh, you know, if you've ever uh, dug into Romans, a lot of times some uh, theologians think that Romans uh, points out that, that unregenerate believers can't know the things of God. And some theologians have taken uh, what the Bible says about that and kind of applied it to everything else. It's, it's, this uh, sin um, clouds the mind, you know, the stain of sin uh, makes it so that uh, the unregenerate mind and will can't know or, or love the things of God. And because this is God's creation a lot of time, and also some theologians think that because the Bible indicates that, that creation itself has fallen, maybe we just can't know things about God. So that's why these put a high emphasis on faith over reason. Um but anyways, this, uh, you know, so like the tension view says that the regenerated mind can supplement faith. However, the faith-seeking understanding view holds that a mind enlightened by faith can do much more. The faith-seeking understanding view holds that a regenerated mind can use reason uh, to explain the truths of faith and also to aid in the interpretation of the Bible and the understanding of theological truths. And it's called the faith-seeking understanding view because Augustine would talk about that you have this faith in God. It's informed by the Bible, right? Uh, and you go out and you try to make sense out of all this using your reason. And if you're regenerated, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit indwells you and has made you a new creation, then that empowers your, your mind so that you can understand the things of God. And, you know, Augustine was... Uh, very uh, neoplatonic so a lot of times he had this idea that kind of 
uh, God would aid you with that by infusing knowledge into you. But anyways, you don't. We don't need to go into that. And I'm, I'm also not an Augustine scholar, so maybe I, I said that wrong. But uh, anyways, you can see here uh, it, it, the attention view and the faith seeking understanding view both put this high emphasis on on faith because they think that maybe because creation has fallen and because people are sinful that 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 uh, makes a barrier as to what they can know. But the faith seeking understanding view puts uh, just says that reason uh, is is a little bit more powerful according to this view if you've been regenerated. The synthesis of faith and reason view is our last one. And again, all these views are explained in detail in that book, Three Views on Faith and Reason. So if you're interested in this, check that book out. But on my slides, it says that the synthesis of faith and reason view says that truths of reason cannot contradict truths of faith. Reason can prepare non-believers for faith. And if you see on my slides here, uh, major Christians who have held to this are Clement of Alexandria, Thomas Aquinas, and William Paley. Uh, you know, Clement of Alexandria lived from 150 A.D. to 215 A.D., really close to that time of Tertullian. So these are two of the, the tension views, synthesis of faith and reason view. They've been around. You know, Augustine was uh, the 4th century uh, if I'm saying that right, uh, 354 A.D. So, uh, you know, the, these are old views. These are very old views, and it surprises me that people who should be knowing what they're talking about don't know what they're talking about, and they're just uh, giving these straw man views of what faith and reason are. But let me talk about the synthesis of faith and reason view. So, now, one thing I want to mention, though, is that even this view doesn't say, it doesn't put reason on par with faith okay none of these views say that reason uh, has is is better than than faith okay because obviously these are christian views and and the whole point of being a christian is that you have faith in god right <laughs> uh, so but anyways yeah so this third view uh, it does not like i said it doesn't hold that reason is higher or more superior to faith it does place a higher emphasis on the uses of reason though uh, so, like, for one, it holds that since God is the creator of the world, all truth is God's truth. And the truths of reason, correctly understood, will never contradict the truths of faith. It, it reminds me of the uh, two books view uh, that you kind of see in the Belgic Confession. You know, it's talking about how since God is the author of Scripture uh, and, you know, the Holy Spirit, uh, like we talked about, is... Uh, inspired the biblical author. So since God is ultimately the author of the Bible, and since God is the creator and sustainer of the universe, what what it says, this uh, doctrine of dual revelation, um, it says that whenever you look out in the world, what you learn from this book of nature is not going to contradict the book of Scripture. It's kind of what this uh, synthesis of faith and reason view is saying. You know, so... Um, yeah, it, it, like I said, it, it doesn't. It's not saying that reason is higher or more superior to faith. It's just placing a little bit higher emphasis on the use of reason, like the other ones. Uh, it is generally thought that even an unregenerate human reason, uh, even an un, even an unregenerated person, can understand some preliminary truths about God that are demonstrable through reason. It is not thought that reason is sufficient by itself to save unbelievers, but that reason is useful in preparing the unbelieving mind for belief in the gospel. So, this view is saying that, like I just kind of all went over, is that maybe um, there are, you know, whatever the Bible means about the world being fallen and human beings being fallen, we still have, we still have minds, right? And... Um, what this is saying is that it, it seems like, or it's claiming that it's possible that even unregenerated people can know some preliminary things about God uh, in the context of showing them rational arguments that show that it's true. Okay, so, but nobody is saying that it's possible to argue somebody into the kingdom, right? Um, they're just saying that you can kind of prepare somebody for faith. Um, none of these Christians believe that, uh, you know, all of these are going to hold that, that old uh, Christian doctrine that the, it's the Holy Spirit that saves somebody. Uh, but they're just saying that you can use reason to prepare non-believers 
for faith, okay? And that's what I wanted to do is go more in depth into this view of faith and reason by Thomas Aquinas uh, just to uh, just to give you some more understanding of this view uh, because that's kind of what I hold to. Uh, so it's really what has driven me throughout this whole series. So maybe this will explain some things. I also maybe we'll explain things if you go back to that apologetic method um, lecture. So yeah, let's talk about this. Um, like I said, Aquinas is one of those uh, uh, major Christian figures who held to the synthesis of faith and reason view. So I just wanted to dig deeper into what he said about it. Um, you can actually see him define what faith is. And when he defines what faith is, he uses Hebrews 11. <laughs> uh, he, like that's, that's exactly how he defines it. Um, if you see his his work, the the Summa Theologica, um, he talks about how faith, and here's his quote: "Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that appear not." And uh, after he says this, he uh, he breaks down his definition. So Aquinas talked about you know so we're talking about the relationship between faith and reason. He, he defines what faith is. He defines what reason is. And I was want, I've got all these uh, uh, slides that are going to help us break down what he says faith is and what he says reason is. The thing is, uh, faith, we just said how he uh, explains it. He used Hebrews 11. He says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that appear not. Now, with faith, you've got the act of faith and the object of faith. He likes to distinguish between these things. With reason, you have the act of reason and the object of reason. So he talks about all this in his writings, and after he breaks it all down, it's really, it's, I think it's pretty interesting because uh, it can really, he makes all, when you're making all these uh, clear distinctions, it really brings out what we think faith is and what reason is and how they relate to each other. And there's some great practical implications I want to talk about at the end of this lecture. So let's talk about, we've just defined what Aquinas said faith is, right? And we said that there's the act of faith and the object of faith. So the act of faith, if you see my slide, it says the will moves the intellect to assent to the truth of a proposition on the basis of a consideration, okay? That's slightly ridiculous definition, <laughs> but you see there it says the will moves the intellect to assent to the truth of a proposition on the basis of a consideration. Aquinas mentioned a couple things that faith is not, okay? Faith is not opinion. He distinguishes between faith and opinion, okay? Opinion, he said, um, is assenting to the truth of a proposition where where you think it could be one thing or another, um, if you see him talk about it, he says, you know, if you're if you're considering, oh, I don't know, you, this could also be uh, obviously uh, when you're considering something that's an objective question, like is it going to rain tomorrow? Uh, but let's say you're talking about food, and you say, well, do I like pizza or do I like uh, 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 burgers more? And you, you can have an opinion. You can even argue for it. Well, burgers are the best because of all these reasons. But I could also see how pizza could be the best. You've got two um, contradictory propositions there. Pizza is the best. Uh, burgers are the best. And you hold to one of them, but you don't necessarily reject the other one. Okay, that's what he calls opinion. And he says faith is not an opinion. Faith, because uh, you see in our definition, the will moves the intellect to assent to the truth of a proposition. Okay. So faith is when you believe that this one thing is true and anything that contradicts that is false, okay? So it's distinguished from opinion. It's also distinguished from uh, from knowing something with certainty, though, okay? Uh, faith does not involve certainty. Propositions believed are not self-evident. And that's, that's what really distinguishes faith from reason, as you'll see here in a second whenever I talk about the act of reason and the act of... Uh, the object of the objects of reason. So I just want to go over this definition one last time, and, and after I've made these distinctions, we'll just it'll make more sense. It, okay, so it says the act of faith is the will is where the will moves the intellect to assent to the truth of a proposition on the basis of a consideration. Okay, one thing I didn't mention was that last part on the basis of a consideration. Aquinas's definition entails that you have some reason 
to believe something. You don't just believe it for no reason, okay? So on the basis of some consideration, you're not certain, okay? Faith doesn't involve certainty. So that's why at the very beginning of the definition, it says the will moves the intellect to assent to the truth of a a proposition. You're not certain. You haven't seen this truth demonstrated in front of your very eyes. So that's why the will has to move the intellect to assent to make the judgment that this proposition is true, okay? But it's on the basis of some consideration or some authority, okay? When Aquinas talks about the object of faith, especially in the context of Christianity, he says ultimately the object of faith is God, okay? If you remember the definition of faith he gave, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that appear not. Um, he, you know, the substance of things hoped for, that's God. Uh, Aquinas says that God is the object of faith. And this really goes well with what was brought out in Hebrews 11, because uh, God is not, we cannot see God directly, right? Um, you know, in the Bible, God appears to people, but those are special manifestations. Like God is... Uh, working in space-time reality in this temporal uh, changing world and and making manifestations of himself. But that's never who he really is, right? It's just his way of communing, communicating with people. So even when God appears to, uh, his special presence occurs in the Bible, it's still not seeing God directly because God is this immaterial, um, infinite, perfect being. Uh, but anyways... Because there's two things about that. For one, God is transcendent, like I've just been saying. So God is not fully known. We can't see God directly. But also, um, even even like in the beatific vision that Aquinas talks about, you know, uh, the new heavens and the new earth where we're in God's presence for all eternity. Even when we can be in God's presence, Aquinas still says, look, God is infinite. Our finite minds can't contain, we can't know God fully. Only God fully knows himself. So he is, he is, uh, it's, it, it really makes sense and it's really fitting for him to be the object of our faith because, um, when you go with that definition, the uh, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that appear not, right? Um, God is this object of our faith. So what we're saying is that whenever you have the act of faith, you, you're the object of your faith is God. You can't see him directly. We know about him from the Bible. We know about him from the way he's interacted with human beings. Um, but he has made promises, and you have faith in him, right? It's not just uh, – th- that's that's one thing that I like to talk about. You know, people say, I, I believe in God. You know, like you might say, are you a Christian or, or, you know, are you religious? And they say, yeah, I believe in God. And I've always wondered, what do they mean when they say they believe in God? Because some people seem to think that when they say, uh, I always try to dig deeper because whenever someone says, I believe in God, a lot of times that what they're saying is that I believe that God exists. I've always found this to be interesting because that's not what biblical faith is. Uh, Of course, someone who's a believer believes that God exists, but Biblical faith is believing in the promises of God so much that you actually act out on that in in your life, okay? So it's not just believing that God exists. It's believing that not only God exists, but he has, he has made promises to humanity, and he has told us what to do. So we, we believe these claims he's made. We believe these promises he's made. We have faith in God, and that faith is in him as the object of faith, and we are believing what he has told us. And we act on that, right? So believing in God, I hope you don't use that in your own life if you're a Christian. I hope you don't use that to say that you believe that he exists. Like if you believe in God, uh, that should mean that you're believing his promises. But anyways, but you you see what we're saying here. Um, God is not fully known to us in this life because he's transcendent. And even if we could see him directly, uh, he's infinite. So we couldn't fully comprehend him. So he's the object of faith, something that's not seen. Um, he's partly known through reasoning, through general revelation, and through scripture, uh, but we can't, right now we see through a glass darkly, right? Um, so, uh, the act of faith, I've got one more slide on it just to, just to bring this all home. I, I kind of got ahead of myself. So, the act of faith, you see, 
in that definition. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that appear not. The act of faith is that when we believe in God um, because of some consideration, right? Like like when, uh, oh, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but for example, let's say I look at all the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, and I've looked at all the evidence that shows that the Bible is, uh, is, is true. Uh, you know, the manuscripts are reliable and all that stuff. So I'm believing all the things that Jesus said because I have considered it, and I think that Jesus really is God. So at this point, when I believe the gospel and I believe that I'm going to be resurrected, if I, um, you know, if I uh, trust in Jesus for salvation and, uh, and I, I try to do my best to, to love God and love my neighbor, um, that is the act of faith where I am assenting to the truth of these things that Jesus said on the basis of some uh, consideration. Uh, usually, you know, if I if I were to tell someone what faith is on the street, I'd say it's it's a, it's a, it's assenting to the truth of a proposition based on some authority um, or some consideration. Like one time, sometimes a, an authority figure can be the consideration that you use. Um, maybe you've looked at the evidence for something and you're not sure, but you're but you have taken a side, but you're not certain about it. You know that. If you've looked at some evidence for yourself, that's okay. But sometimes uh, someone who's an authority figure, like a scientist or a, a priest or a theologian or a, a professional philosopher, will tell me something, and I'll just say, okay, well, I, don't, I haven't looked at the evidence, but I'm just going to take it on faith. I'm going to believe in you and, uh, and you know, assume that you've seen these things and that you're telling me the truth. That would be the act of faith, right? And, and that person would be the object of my faith. Uh, so... Anyways, I, I feel like I'm going in, in too much detail and maybe kind of going in circles. So I'm just going to mention the object of faith really quickly and we'll move into the, the act and object of reason. So uh, in our definition, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance of things hoped for is the object of faith. The act of faith is, is that portion where it says the evidence of things that appear not. The conviction of things that appear not, right? So... Uh, so maybe that gives you a little bit better understanding of what we're saying, or at least what Aquinas talked about when he talked about the act of faith, the object of faith, and what faith is. Uh, with reason, it's a lot easier to explain. Uh, reason, if you are familiar with medieval philosophy, uh, the medieval scholastic philosophers talked about the three acts of the mind. These are things that are thought to be unique to human beings. Uh, uh, Non-human animals aren't thought to be able to do this kind of thing. They do have cognition, obviously, and they have these uh, uh, ways of seeing the world and, and doing things, but they don't. We don't think they can do it as, to the level and at the at this at the kind that human beings can. Well, anyways, the three acts of the mind are apprehension, judgment, and reasoning. Apprehension is just whenever you uh, either just understand or know a concept, or just see it directly, pretty much. Um, for example, if I look at an apple. Or maybe I just understand an apple. Like if I'm looking at the color red, I'm apprehending the color red. Um, if I'm looking at an apple, I'm, I'm apprehending an apple. If someone teaches me what an apple is, I'm apprehending that concept. Now, judgment is a little bit different. It's when you take two simple concepts, like I just talked about, two things that you apprehended, and you make judgments and you combine these concepts. Does that make sense? So if I know what red is and I know what an apple is, I can look at a red apple and I can say, this apple is red. I'm taking those two simple concepts that I apprehended, I, I understood, and I'm putting them in relation to each other. Uh, uh, judgment also involves assenting to the truth of propositions. This proposition is true. This proposition is false. Things like that. Reasoning is when you take two judgments you've made and you combine those, two or more judgments. So, you know, reasoning, obviously, I could form a syllogism. Now, I've understood what apple is in apprehension. I've understood what red is in apprehension. Maybe I've judged that I'm looking at a red apple. I'm putting those, uh, those simple concepts in relation to each other to make a judgment. Well, I can take two or more judgments and I can start doing reasoning with that. Uh, so, for example, maybe I, after looking at an apple for a while, I, I start to try to reason about fruit. So I've come up with a syllogism. And I, I say, all edible objects with seeds are fruit. This red apple has seeds and is edible. Therefore, this red apple is fruit. So I'm taking, you can see in, in those uh, 
in my two premises and my conclusion, I not only have simple concepts, but I have simple concepts placed in relation to each other. So I've got all these different judgments and I'm placing these judgments in certain relations that lead me to a conclusion. And that's the process of reasoning. Okay. So the act of reason is anytime you're doing these three acts of the mind, apprehension, judgment, or reasoning. The object of reason is easy. It's, it's anything that you can know through the three acts of the mind, right? Um, but I, we want to be careful when we're distinguishing reason from faith. If you remember, when we was just defining faith, we're saying that it's something that you haven't, you're not certain of. Um, so you have to, the will has to assent to the truth of a proposition of faith because uh, you're not certain. You've ruled out the other possibilities, but you're not 100% certain, okay? Or, or maybe you're not, uh, maybe our looser standards in postmodern times, you know, a lot of times we'll say, well, I'm 99% certain, so it might as well be 100% certain. But anyways, um, you're not certain uh, past a, a, a reasonable doubt or something like that. Well, anyways, um, we're making this distinction. With the objects of reason, these are things that you do know, Okay. The, your will doesn't have to move your intellect to assent to the truth of a uh, object of reason because you've already seen it for yourself. You know, So if I say 1 plus 1 equals 2, I understand that. Um, I don't have to have faith that 1 plus 1 equals 2 because I know it's true. I, in understanding what that means, I know that that is true. I'm, I'm certain of it. So I don't have to have faith that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Anytime that you aren't certain you're, you're doing faith, and uh, if you, but if you have seen it for yourself, that's an object of reason. Okay. Well, the interesting thing about Aquinas's views of faith and reason is that you can see it, it really establishes the the relationship between the two. Okay. Um, he distinguishes between what's uh, between basically three ways that they relate to each other. You've got truths of faith only, truths of both faith and reason, and then you've got truths of reason only. So let's look at this, because this is going to help us bring out the pr practical implications of all this. Truths of reason only are things that you just use your mind, the three acts of the mind, to discover. Okay, And in the context of faith and reason, we're talking about basically things that aren't mentioned in the Bible. right? So a truth of reason only would be something like the number of planets in the solar system the atomic weight of carbon, life cycles of butterflies. The Bible doesn't talk about these things. These are things that we use our mind, we use reason to go out in the world and discover for ourselves. But the, like I said, we can also, uh, what's entailed in all this, if you've seen it for yourself, you know, again, maybe the number of planets in the solar system, maybe I haven't seen the evidence myself, but I take it on faith. <laughs> uh, if a scientist tells me, I take it on faith that that scientist is telling the truth and that he or she has seen the evidence and I'm just taking it on faith. But if I see these things for myself, then it's a truth of reason, right? But these are, we're, we're calling these truths of reason only because the Bible doesn't make uh, statements about it, doesn't make claims about it. They're, they're truths of reason only because God hasn't revealed this to you. You go discover it yourself. Uh, now, here's what I've always found interesting and, and kind of distinguishes the the synthesis of faith and reason view from the others. Um, there's a there's a place where truths of faith and truths of reason inter, intersect, okay? So this would be things that the Bible talks about that we think that we can use reason to confirm for ourselves. And this is stuff that we've been talking about all um, this whole series long. God's existence, we think, is a truth of both faith and reason. We can use reason, like, like I showed you in all those lectures on God's existence, whether it's cosmological arguments or moral arguments or design arguments. You, whether it's a cumulative case or just you find one of those extremely compelling, you know what I'm saying? Like, like the Kalam argument, for example. If you look through that, it's you might not be... 100% certain, like Cartesian certainty or something, like I think therefore I am certain. But it's like using that logical process of logical reasoning, you're 99% sure that God exists and that rules out everything else, right? But you've seen the evidence for yourself, so that becomes a truth of reason for you. Uh, and then you can, we haven't done this in these lecture series, but 
Aquinas thought you could, and a lot of uh, philosophical theology. We think that we can, uh, after after reasoning to God's existence, we can reason to what we think God is like. Uh, so those are other things that the Bible talks about, but we can also use reason to look at the existence of the human soul. We had uh, we had lectures on that where I presented all these arguments that show that we have a soul and we're not just material beings. All of these things, you can use your mind. You can use the three acts of uh, reason, the three acts of the mind to come to know for yourself apart from what Scripture says. But Scripture also says these things too. Scripture says that God exists and God is, uh, exists in these certain ways with these certain attributes and that we all have souls. So this, these can be objects of uh, faith, excuse me, not objects. These can these propositions are faith propositions because God has told us that in, in Scripture, but they are can also be uh, uh, reason, uh, propositions of reason because we can um, know these just on reason alone apart from Scripture. So it's both uh, uh, truths of both faith and reason, okay? And then you've got truths of faith only. Now, this really cuts to what we're talking about when we mention what faith is, okay? Because what we've, what we've been uh, touching on, especially with the Hebrews 11 definition, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, this really cuts to what a truth of faith only is, okay? When we talk about truths of faith only, we're talking about things that we can't prove using human reason alone, the only reason why we know this is the case is because God has revealed it to us in Scripture, okay, or told it to someone uh, directly uh, by a manifestation of himself. These are truths like God is triune, Jesus is both God and man, and the and the resur- that we're all going to get resurrected one day. Um, it's well known in philosophy and philosophical theology that you can't, there's no philosophical argument that God must be triune. You've got all these arguments that show that God exists and God must be one, but nobody ever uh, came up with an argument that that says if you know there must be just one God and that God has to be triune. There's no process of reasoning that'll lead you to that, but we believe it because God has revealed it to us, and uh, we have we think we have good reasons for believing not only that God exists but also that God has revealed these things to us. So uh, that God is triune is a truth of faith only. So is that Jesus is uh, the hypostatic union, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And so is the truth that Jesus will resurrect us all one day, okay? These are the true pr- propositions of faith, okay? Because, you know, if you're into apologetics, you're into philosophy and all that, Here's and here's what I like to talk about the practical implications of all this, okay? When you're talking about the relationship between faith and reason, now, the thing is, not everybody has, and you've already seen, I, I talk for hours and hours and all this stuff, right? And maybe, I'm, I'm glad if you've listened to this whole thing that you took, that you uh, found the time to be able to do it. But not everybody has time to sit there and study all this apologetics and study uh, philosophy and systematic theology and all these things. And a lot of people, uh, you know, my wife, for example, she's just believed all these things her whole life. She's not as analytically minded. I'm, she's a a brilliant woman, don't get me wrong, but she isn't the kind of person that's always needed to know, needed to see the evidence firsthand or or reason through it all to make sense out of it all like, like I am. I couldn't believe that Christianity was true unless I saw evidence and I, I made sense out of it all. So that's what I mean when I say analytically minded. And some people just aren't as analytically minded. They they just say, you know what, this, this is all true and I just know it is and, that, and that's all there is to it. Um, they can appreciate this stuff, but but what I'm saying is, um, a lot of these truths that are truths of both faith and reason, like that God exists, and uh, what were other things that the soul exists, that uh, God exists in these certain ways, and there's many more than that. Um, these are things that people can take on faith. You know, you can you can tell someone. Uh, well, you know, a lot of times if they just believe that the Bible is the Word of God, maybe they have subjective reasons for believing it. But usually you've got to have some reason for it. But whether it's because your parents told you and your parents are reliable, or you know that theologians have studied this and, and thought about it and argued for it and given evidence for it for centuries in Christianity, you're taking the truth, the, the truths of these things on their authority, okay? So um, 
and other people, if they have time and they want it, and they want to know this, the things like God's existence and the 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 Jesus rose from the dead and that um, and that we have a soul. These are things that you can study for yourself and and learn for yourself using reason. Okay. So it's it's really interesting if you want to talk about strengthening someone's faith. What are we talking about? Uh, when you strengthen someone's faith, I think this is why apologetics is so useful. If I were to, if I, if you heard me say I stre- I helped strengthen that person's faith, what I would be saying is that I showed them, I demonstrated to them truths that that are um, truths of faith and reason, right? I showed them using reason and evidence that these truths that they took on faith, they can see the truth of it for themselves. So now it quits being a truth of faith and becomes a truth of reason for them. And whenever, if you can kind of think of it as two circles, the circles getting closer and closer together, the truths of reason engulfing the truths of faith more and more, uh, you're still going to be left out. You're still going to have all those truths of faith only left over. So faith is never going to be eliminated. The 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 belief that uh, God is triune, that J- Jesus is both God and man, the resurrection of the dead, um, other things like that. These are truths of faith only. But those, the, but their ascent to the truth of these things becomes stronger and stronger, even though they still we still can't prove these things to be the case. Does that make sense? So that's kind of that's what we're saying is the the relationship between faith and reason. The Bible tells us things, some things we can confirm using reason alone, some things we can't confirm, and uh, th- that um, obviously there's truths about the world the Bible doesn't touch on. Those are truths of reason only, but that intersection where the Bible says things that we can confirm for ourselves, those are things that a lot of people take on faith, but if you show them then that becomes an object of reason for them. And whenever you have more and more reasons to believe that all of that is true and you've seen the evidence for yourself, then it makes all these leftover uh, propositions of faith only, it makes your ascent to those even stronger. And that's what we talk about, strengthening someone's faith. And that's what we're getting at when we use this uh, synthesis of faith and reason view to talk about the relationship between faith and reason. So, I've been talking a while on this on this slide, but my slide says, yeah, all truths in the Bible can be taken on faith. Some can be confirmed through reason. Others can be shown to be free of contradiction. That's another thing. Truths of faith only, we can still use reason to show to somebody that at least, yeah, can I, can I come up with an argument for the, the Trinity where I start not using the Bible whatsoever and I say, this is why we know that God is triune? No, I can't do that. But I can show what the Bible says about God's triunity, and I can show that this isn't contradictory using reason. So reason still has a play, a role to play in the truths of faith. We can show that it's not contradictory to believe that God is both God, uh, that Jesus is both God and man. So, so reason is helpful in all those cases. But you see that it never eliminates faith. And a, as a Christian, someone who believes in the promises of God. You still place the you put faith as the highest thing, right? Because uh, that that's all, that's all we're put on this earth to do is trust in God and and to serve Him, right? So and to glorify Him. So, anyways, that's my uh, lecture on faith and reason. Now, let's talk about uh, some practical implications. I've been kind of probably jumping ahead of myself and talking about these a little bit, um, but I, I just think there's some really neat practical implications that you can use this definition of faith and reason on. Uh, in your day-to-day life, but especially when you're doing evangelism and apologetics, okay? So obviously, the first thing you can use this understanding of faith and reason to do when you're talking to non-believers is to, one, hopefully you can dispel this myth that faith is believing something contrary to the evidence. If someone ever says that, say, no, no, no. That might be your definition of what faith is, but that is not the Christian definition for what faith is. We believe in the promises of God for, for very good reasons, Okay. We might not be able to show you that we're all going to be resurrected using some philosophical argument, but I can uh, I can believe that God exists and that Jesus rose from the dead for all these good reasons, like like I learned in my uh, apologetics class, and all that gives us the basis for believing these other promises that God that God said, right? Um, so our, our faith is based on the authority of God and Jesus, and we know that God and Jesus have told us these things because we know that the Bible is the Word of God. 
And uh, if you're if you're just if you're just coming in on this lecture, I have this whole series of lectures before this. This is the 28th one. I have a whole series of lectures before this giving reasons for why the Bible is the Word of God. That's not a circular process. There's there's a non-circular way to to show that the Bible is the Word of God. So if you're interested in all that, listen to the other lectures. Um, but yeah, especially you want to say, look, I don't know where you got this definition of faith, uh, what uh, faith is, that it's believing something contrary to the evidence, because Christians since the f- second century have had mature, detailed views of what faith and reason are and how they relate to each other, and they have argued for this. So we've had these understandings of faith and reason for thousands of years, and it is definitely not what you're saying it is if you say that faith is believing something contrary to the evidence. But another practical implication, you know, that, and that was something I actually thought of. Now, you know, I don't, I don't want to be making fun of anyone, but I just thought that this idea that faith is uh, something that's believing something contrary to the evidence, <laughs> it seemed to me to be pretty ironic because it seems like those popular atheists are doing exactly what they are saying faith is, right? They're saying that faith is believing something contrary to the evidence. Well, a quick Google search will show you that your definition of faith is incorrect, and but you believe that that's what faith is, contrary to the evidence. But anyways, I, I just thought that was that was kind of funny. But um, I wanted to show you something, though. When, you know, when you want to start talking about, uh, you know, when we start talking about talking to a non-believer, especially to science, very science-minded people that that think that they're all about reason alone and, and they don't need faith whatsoever. You know, I mean, a lot of times someone who says that they don't need faith at all is usually someone who holds to the incorrect view of what faith is. But if you use this mature view of what faith and reason are, you can actually show atheists that a lot of times they they really do have faith. For one, you know, I've t- I, we mentioned, right? So like tomorrow, um, maybe the forecast says it's going to rain or maybe the forecast says uh, it's it's going to snow. And let's say that the forecast says it's like a 99% chance. If I see the forecast, I haven't seen the evidence. I don't. I couldn't tell you what a Doppler radar system is or how it works or any of this stuff. But I would take it on faith, right? I would have faith in that meteorologist that he or she knows what they're doing and knows, understands all this. And they wouldn't give me 99% unless they were certain that it was going to snow or rain tomorrow. So I can take that on faith, right? I haven't seen the evidence for myself, but I'm, I'm getting rid of, I'm getting, I'm assenting to the truth that it's going to rain or snow tomorrow. And I am assenting, uh, I'm rejecting the proposition that it won't rain or snow tomorrow, right? So it's it's me believing that on faith. Uh, they're the authority figure. I have reasons to believe they know what they're doing. So I'm a, I, that's a faith position for me that it's going to rain or snow tomorrow. Well, that happens all the time in the atheist community. You know, not not everybody has the time to go and get a science degree in every single discipline, right? Uh but when you start talking about these big worldview questions, where did we come from? You know, like so like the the beginning of life. Yes, maybe uh maybe some of these naturalistic scientists who believe that all life literally, you know, arose from a single-celled organism for uh, random chance, uh, it wasn't God, it was just a natural process and then that evolved into human beings eventually. Uh, maybe they have some really good uh, reasons for believing that's the case within their field of study. But not every atheist can go and study all that and see the evidence for him or herself, right? Uh, no, they take the belief that all life arose by blind, random, natural processes on the authority of that science, uh, that scientist, right? So in this case, the, the lay atheist has faith that life arose for random natural processes based on the authority of the scientist. So that's a, it's actually a faith proposition. But having said all this, now some things, and we're especially going to get at this in uh, our lecture, our next lecture on scientism, some things have to be taken on faith because you can't use science to uh, to to confirm these things. You know, I don't want to say that all atheists are just sci or are hold to what we call uh, the view called scientism, which is this belief that science is the only way to knowledge. Um, but when you start talking about, um, you know, 
knowing that there is no God that holds the law, uh, that holds everything in existence, um, knowing that there is no God, I mean, we're talking about something that you can't see, right? Um, you're going to be using philosophy to reason to this, uh, but you can't confirm it. You especially can't confirm it with science. Uh, but yeah, you know, you just look at some of the beliefs, common atheistic beliefs, like I have on my slide here, that, that there's constant laws of nature, the existence of the uh, the existence of the universe without any cause external to it, that suffering is evil. A lot of times, atheists believe that uh, pain is is evil and it should be avoided. You know, you can ask someone, why do you believe that this is the way the world is if you're talking to a non-believer? And, and when they start to give you the reasons for why they believe this, if you ever see, you know, like, well, how do you know that that's the case? How do you know life arose? Not, not as a way to have a gotcha moment, but if someone's belief that uh, there is no God and that life arose for no reason from, uh, uh, from blind natural processes, Unless they've seen the evidence for themselves, they really have faith that that's the case. And what what we're going to get into in this next one, especially for people who believe that science is the only way to knowledge, we're going to show that um, uh, that's that's actually self defeating or it's self undermining, and that you need to use philosophy. Uh, to, you need to open the door for philosophy to come in for you to be able to know some of these things about what's going on beyond the universe. Uh, but but yeah. You know, and, and I was hoping that maybe when you understand this uh, this view of faith and reason, it can kind of show you what we're getting at with our apologetic method. In that apologetic method lecture that I had, it's like episode three of this series, I believe. It's, it's titled Apologetic Method. I'm not very creative. Um, we talked about the three-step apologetic method. You, pray or, you prayfully walk someone through... Uh, these bit major concepts that truth, the object of truth exists. It's actually, un, it's it, you can't deny that object of truth exists. It, it definitely does. That God exists and that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, you you do this prayerfully, right? We don't. We're not saying that uh, you can talk someone into being a Christian. As Christians, we believe that that people are regenerated only by the uh, saving work of the Holy Spirit. But you have to hear the gospel, right? If you heard me talk about that um, synthesis of faith and reason view, what we're saying is we're preparing people. It's what I like to call worldview translation. Do you know what I'm saying? So like uh, if I'm going to go to China, for example, and I'm going to try to preach the gospel in China, I wouldn't just bring nothing but English Bibles with me because I know that they're not going to be able to understand. Uh, I mean, a lot of them will if they've studied English. But the people who who only speak Mandarin or, or whatever aren't going to be able to read those Bibles. So I know that I have to translate the Bible into Mandarin so they can even understand it in the first place, right? Well, in Western countries, in the United States, for example, people are raised uh, going to secular schools. And we've got a separation of church and state here, and it's been taken to an extreme uh, I would say, so that you can't even talk about anything about God in, in, in school, almost, in a lot of places. So, uh, by default, someone goes through this system, and all they've learned about the world, you want to talk about why are we here? Well, all they learned was science, and science just explains everything in natural terms. Uh, they think of reality in terms of uh, fundamental particles and how they interact, and everything is physical. They haven't, if they didn't, if they weren't brought up in a Christian home or a religious household, they're not going to think that immaterial things even exist, right? So, so whenever you try to preach the gospel to them and tell them that their soul is going to go to heaven or hell, they're going to think that souls don't even exist. And it's like it's really similar to you trying to give a an English Bible to someone who only reads Mandarin. They're going to they're not going to be able to understand it. So uh, what I think apologetics is, is like worldview translation. You try to you try to show someone that it's reasonable to believe uh, the underlying concepts of Christianity, that God exists, that uh, Jesus rose from the dead, that you do have a soul that's going somewhere. God is this moral authority over all mankind. You're trying to at least show them that these things are reasonable in preparation for them to be able to accept the truth of the gospel by the work of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? 
It's worldview translation, just like you would translate a, a, a language before you go into a country. So also, if you live in a country where everyone is taught that none of this stuff is even possible, you translate where you're coming from and just try to show them that these things are at the very least reasonable to believe. And it prepares them to, to accept the truth of the gospel. So, and also, like I said, you uh, understanding the correct relationship between faith and reason, you can understand what we mean when we say that we're going to strengthen the faith of believers. Um, of course, God has said that you know if uh, the world will know, the world will know me through through you. And He's talking to His church. You know, we're supposed to act like Jesus Christ as much as we can and show the world His love and show we our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, his love that's a part of strengthening people's faith right and i've heard so many people who say that they're not a believer because they encountered christians and christians were really nasty to them so our actions are an apologetic too uh so you don't want i'm not saying that this is the only way to strengthen someone's faith Uh, obviously living out the christian life uh, and being a good example of jesus love to the world is an apologetic in itself but when you're talking about uh the things of the mind Uh, This is how we strengthen faith. You show someone, you demonstrate to them the truths that are that are at the intersection between faith and reason. You show them so that something they took on faith becomes something that they know as an object of reason. And then that strengthens the the other uh, propositions that are left over that are only propositions of faith. So anyways, I feel like I've repeated a lot of things in this lecture (laughs) over and over. Um, So I'm just going to cut it off here. But I hope this was helpful to you, and I hope this helps dispel this uh, idea that faith is, is believing something you know to be false. It's definitely not. And regardless, you know, I'm, I, I didn't even give reasons for why I think that Aquinas' view was the best. I'm just saying that's the one I like best. If you're interested in, in that debate, go check out that book, Three Views on Faith and Reason, and you can see why they argue for these different views. Um but yeah, uh, it, it's a it's a fascinating topic, and I hope this has helped. Uh, let me repeat the questions for reflection real quick, and then we'll do we'll we'll do our closing quote, and then we'll be done. So if you remember the the questions for reflection were: Have you ever heard someone say that faith is believing in something although you know it is false, or although there is evidence against it? Two: Have you ever heard someone say that atheism uses only reason and religion uses only faith? Three: How would you answer someone who claims that religions only utilize faith? Um, because of today, I think I've presented this quote before, but this is a quote from um, Hugh Ross of Reasons to Believe. He says, The God who inspired the Bible is the same God who made the universe, earth, and all life. This God is the very definition of truth. Therefore, nature's record will never contradict Scripture and vice versa. Just basically Hugh Ross's statement of the doctrine of dual revelation. So yeah, let me do a shout out to SES and Kingdom Preparatory Academy, and then I'll talk about our next lecture. So um, you know, at the end of all these, I like to just give a shout out to my to my seminary where I got my PhD in philosophy of religion. I love SES. If you are interested in learning about faith and reason way more deeper than what I could do in this lecture, um, or anything uh, that has to do with apologetics, but also philosophy and theology. Biblical Studies, Master of Divinity, all these things you can learn at SES. Um, If you want to dive deeper, this is the place to go. Every degree program they have is online, to my knowledge. Uh, You go to www.ses.edu, and they have things as small as certificates to bachelor's degrees to master degrees, Master of Divinity, Doctor of Ministry, Ph.D. Um, I highly recommend Southern Evangelical Seminary and Bible College. It was great. Um, they, they guided me through the whole thing. Um, I did, I did most of my degrees online and, and I loved it and got a lot out of it. So, uh, but they, but they're in North Carolina. If you want to do it in person, they also have in-person classes as well. So I highly recommend Southern Evangelical Seminary and Bible College, um, put a big emphasis on apologetics, but obviously you can learn a lot more than just that there. I also want to plug Kingdom Preparatory Academy. Uh, this is a classical Christian school here in Lubbock, Texas. It goes all the way from pre-K to 12th grade. And it's a classical Christian school. Like I said, they have the classical model. It's also done on a university model. So the students only go to school 
uh, part of the week and the, and the rest of the week they're home. So, for example, my kids go to school on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they're home on Tuesday and Thursday. And it really it gets them ready for like their schedule is going to be in college. Uh, but also it's a classical school. They teach them how to think in the context of each subject. They don't teach them what to think, right? And uh, so it it's puts a high emphasis on reason and uh, logic. And, of course, it's done from a Christian worldview. So Jesus Christ, uh, every subject is, uh, is taught in the context of Jesus and his creation and his goodness. Um, so we love it. Um, I've told people I'd work two jobs if I had to. To, to keep my kids going there. So highly recommend it. If you're interested, go to kingdomprep.org or, uh, or just Google it and check out the, um, uh, you can, you can contact them through email. You can contact them f- through a phone call or you can pay them, pay them a visit. I highly recommend it. If you are interested in a classical Christian alternative to education in the Lubbock, Texas area. But yes, uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to do a lecture on scientism. It's this belief that uh, science is the way to knowledge. So uh, we're going to try to argue that this is an incorrect view. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be our second to last lecture. So we're really coming down to the end of this uh, first season. So um, I hope to see you there. And I hope you have a great day.